founder and executive director of the Student Run Emergency Housing Unit, a nonprofit homeless shelter operating since 2011, where students provide shelter, food, services, and community to individuals experiencing homelessness in Philadelphia. Her most recent, recent project is the Breaking Bread Company, communities of tiny homes and services for people and their pets who are exper experiencing homelessness. Stephanie teaches history of poverty, homelessness, and resistance movements in Center City, Peace and Justice at Villanova University. Please welcome Stephanie. Thank you so much for um, inviting me here to speak today. So, uh, I'm gonna sit if you don't mind. Um, recently, we really injured my foot, so we're gonna try to stay off it. <clears throat> Last week, I received a warm email from Hugh Taft Morales to prepare me for today's talk. He said, and I quote, being candid and open about your struggles to live a life closer to your values is often inspiring. No need to hide the fact that we are all along the way to living up to our ideals. But better to have ideals than not, right? <laughs> with these words in mind, I will start today with my struggles. And um, as I read this speech, I wonder if any of you might be able to start counting in your head the number of struggles that you hear as I go along. I'm curious, I haven't tabulated it, but I'm curious if anyone here is able to. Okay. December 10th, 2010. The words stared at me from my computer screen. They shook me to my core. Quote, your class was eye-opening for me. I learned about horrifying injustices in the world, many that I, as an American voter, taxpayer, and consumer are contributing to. And I feel hopeless and helpless to affect any change. I'm depressed. I feel paralyzed. It makes me not want to go on." End quote. Since 2003, I have been teaching world civilization courses at Villanova University and exposing my college students to issues of global poverty in my courses. I was asking my students to make connections between our choices and human suffering. I wanted to awaken in them compassion for others. But reading this email, I realized that I gave my students no outlet for this pain and awareness. No action plan. No hope for a better tomorrow. In the days after I received this email, I continued to wrestle with this problem. I had trouble sleeping. I kept questioning, what good is an education? What use was my teaching, if not to inspire and move my students to action? December 14th, 2010. The rain was pouring down my car window. I was starting to have trouble driving through it. Holiday preparation filled the corners of my mind. There were gifts to purchase, decorations to hang, seasonal gatherings to plan, but there was an uneasiness that pervaded my thoughts. A worry kept creeping in. I turned on the radio. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas started playing. I didn't need reminding. I wasn't in the mood. I turned the radio dial. It settled on 90.9 FM, WHYY's NPR outlet. The show is here and now. I was lulled by the voices of college students. I remember that I had grading to do. Suddenly, I was listening to the solutions to the problem that had been nagging me since the student's email, keeping me up at night with worry. These Harvard college students on the radio show were describing the homeless shelter in Harvard Square that they operated, and they were calling on others to follow suit. This was my Eureka moment. I would take up their call to action. I would harness my students' passion to make a difference. 
their boundless energy, their empathy and compassion, their deep concern for human suffering. And I would channel this into action designed to mitigate the suffering around us. I would open up a homeless shelter in Philly and staff it with my college students. I would get them out of their plastic bubble and expose these students to people and circumstances that had the potential of changing their worldviews. January 2nd, 2011, I trudged down the stairs and surveyed the damage. Gifts, wrapping, and dried pine needles still cluttered the carpet, evidence that another holiday season had come and gone. There were hours left before we would re-enter the world of work and school. Another Christmas was in the books, and now I was left feeling that empty January 2nd blues. The loudness of the holiday season distracted me from the questions that had nagged. Now I had the time and quiet to listen to my own thoughts. January 16, 2011. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It was 34 degrees outside and I was sitting in my car at the super fresh parking lot. I had my checklist in hand. Whole chicken, lemons, potatoes, rosemary and sage. My post-holiday to-do list was slowly but surely becoming my to-done list. I zipped up my coat and took a deep, deep breath, ready to exit the car and face the frigid air. Why do I live in a place where the air hurts my face, I wondered. My car was tuned to, to NPR again. As I reached for the keys in my ignition, I heard the booming voice of Martin Luther King Jr. reciting his I Have a Dream speech. I've heard snippets of it dozens of times in my life. But today, NPR was playing the speech in its entirety. I slowly pulled my hands away from the keys. I settled back into my seat, and I let his words wash over me. I began to cry, softly at first, and then suddenly sobbing. There was an urgency in his message. We desperately need to cultivate peace and justice. In, the, in December of 2010, in the midst of what I called my era of unrest, I happened to be listening to the WHYY outlet, and when I heard those students, those Harvard students who had called me to action, I was inspired. So now, now that it is Martin Luther King Day, and I'm reminded after the holiday that this is why we do the work. There's so much more left to be done. I harness my students' passion to make a difference, their boundless energy, their empathy and compassion. And I opened this homeless shelter in Philly, staffed with my college students. We called it the Student-Run Emergency Housing Unit of Philadelphia. And this shelter served to get my students out of their bubble. My students were eager to make a difference, but unsure of where to start. I based our work uh, off of a book by Scott Sider called Shelter, where Harvard meets the homeless. We had a lot of spirit, but very little knowledge of what it would take to run a shelter. The first thing we did was make the trip to Harvard student-run shelter over spring break to see it in action. At the end of that first week, I brought my students into a small coffee shop in Boston and said, we've seen what this entails. We can stop now or we can press on. What do you want to do? They were more motivated than ever. That were heavily caffeinated. <laughs> in either event, we came back to Philadelphia and got to work. Within six months, we had lawyers, insurance agents, a location, a 501c3 status from the IRS, and sleep deprivation. We opened our doors and our hearts on November 1st, 2011. Students who had started volunteering at the shelter to do good returned regularly and found themselves receiving far more gifts than they ever hoped to give. Momentum grew for our project. Newspapers and radio shows began to cover Street Hub, and as word spread, universities and other nonprofits began to reach out to ask me how to be involved. I had tapped into a deep need, a desire people have to be a force of good. College students were tired of being labeled lazy and narcissistic. They were eager to make a difference and were looking for opportunities to do so. And there was so much need. In my excitement, I wanted to meet this need. And this is how Sri Hub ended up hosting three homeless shelters in our first year of operation. 
One shelter served LGBT youth, the most vulnerable amongst the homeless population. 40% of homeless youth are LGBT, and once homeless, are more likely to commit suicide. The second shelter was for transitional or episodically homeless individuals. This population makes up the largest se segment of the homeless population. These people are often hidden from public view. They are in shelters or couch surfing or in abandoned cars or buildings. These people are often highly functional. Many have jobs. They don't fit the stereotype of those experiencing homelessness. But with the rising cost of housing and stagnant wages, they cannot afford rent. Our third shelter served individuals who are chronically homeless, defined as an individual with a disabling condition, such as substance abuse, serious mental illness, developmental disability, or chronic physical illness, who has either been continuously homeless for a year or more, or who has had at least four episodes of homelessness in the past three years. People who are chronically homeless consume a majority of the system's resources, and even though they're a minority of the population, they are the public face of homelessness. When I started this project, I got considerable resistance from Villanova's Office of Risk Management. Their work at the school and the role of risk management at all schools was to find potential risk and avoid it. They were not about to let me move forward with this project, which from their perspective was a liability for Villanova. They explained all the hidden risks of taking Villanova students into the city to run a homeless shelter. These students could be assaulted, raped, or murdered. By the time the phone call was over, I was beginning to think these students needed this experience more than I even realized. To me, the greatest risk was not this project, but that they would end up becoming risk management officers. <laughs> I got another call from campus administration. I was ruffling feathers. That's what I do. This call was from the vice president of mission and ministry, Barbara Wall. She explained to me that she was hearing from some administrators that they were concerned about the project. Barbara was in a position to support the endeavor and assuage the concerns of other administrators. But in order to gain her support, I had to get the blessing of Sister Mary Scullion a Catholic nun who founded Project Home and was an authority on homelessness in Philadelphia and throughout the country. I didn't know Sister Mary or her work and was daunted by the task. What if she didn't approve of my idea? All this work come on one person's blessing? I was in search, went in search of the Holy Grail. I armed myself with as much information as I could gather about her work and homelessness and I scheduled a meeting with her. My approach to meetings is always to be humble. I knew little about this work, but if I was going to succeed, I first needed to speak to people working in the trenches and on the front lines. I'm not sure how I imagined Sister Mary, maybe austere or humorless. She couldn't have been farther from these things. This was the first, but not the last time, working on this project forced me to abandon my stereotypes. Sister Mary had a strong South Philly working class accent and demeanor. She exuded worth, warmth, and compassion. And by the time she dropped the F-bomb and referenced Stephen Colbert, I knew she was my new idol. <laughs> she was enthusiastic about my idea. She had been working in the field for decades and believed that youth needed to provide new and fresh solutions and hope. Youth did not seem homeless as an inevitable part of our urban landscape. I left the meeting with Grail in hand. The fates were sealed a couple weeks later when Sister Mary came to Villanova to give a keynote address, and to a full audience, she expressed her excitement over the work that the students and faculty were doing to open a student-run shelter in Philadelphia. With holy ground, the Grail in hand, we opened our doors that fall. While students were changed by the experience of running a shelter, they were also in the position to create meaningful change. The unmatched level of energy and enthusiasm of young adults gives college students an advantage when dealing with the struggles of the marginalized and oppressed. 
While in their peak period of optimism, college students are able to join the fight to end homelessness with a hopeful disposition. This enhances their genuine fearlessness when dealing with tough situations. Students learn valuable lessons about leadership, problem solving, and public service. Students are also forward thinking and offer innovative ideas. They aren't jaded by the system and they creatively envision different, more humane possibilities for our future and our communities. The experience of running a shelter allows these students to break out of their normal and comfortable environment. They put names and faces to the people of homelessness and develop relationships with homeless guests that compels them to reconsider some of their ideas about poverty, homelessness, and citizenship. They are also start to comprehend the structural barriers that are in place, which make it difficult to climb out of homelessness. Street Hop students learn leadership through hands-on work running a shelter. They have the opportunity to learn skills like grant writing and fundraising, staff management and problem solving. They learn teamwork and the power each individual has to make a positive difference. Through service learning and guided readings, Students grapple with structural injustices that lead to homelessness. Street Hub students are given opportunities to advocate for people experiencing homelessness. They attend conferences, meet with representatives, and engage in letter writing campaigns. After graduation, Street Hub students are better prepared than most to work for policy change that are needed to reduce homelessness. There are Street Hub grads working on fair housing initiatives, livable wage policies, education and prison reform, mental and physical health initiatives. Street Hub is a start, but we need more cities and school, schools throughout the country to follow our model. We need to invest in programs which create the compassionate leaders of tomorrow who are ready to tackle these issues. We need to empower youth, and we need to imagine a more humane system. The system we currently have is anything but humane. We live in a country where there are six vacant homes for every one person who is homeless. The problem is not lack of housing. According to Oxfam, eight people have more money than the bottom half of the entire world's population. Six of these billionaires from Forbes' list of the world's richest people are American entrepreneurs. Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates, Berkshire Hathaway chairman and CEO Warren Buffett, Amazon founder and CEO Jeff Bezos, Oracle co-founder Larry Ellison, former New York mayor Michael Bloomberg, and Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg. These eight men have a net worth of $426 billion, more than the bottom half of humanity, which consists of 3.6 billion people. The problem is not lack of money. The cause of homelessness is not lack of resources. It is the uneven and unequal distribution of the world's resources. Hunger Free America analyzed population data from 2015 to 2017 and just released its report that has grim statistics for Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, the number of people who can't afford enough food increased by 22% in the last six years. Some 300,000 people in this city, roughly one in five residents, live in households that the federal government determined to be food insecure. More than 25% of Philadelphians live in poverty, according to the 2017 census figures. Homelessness is a growing problem in the United States, but it has not always existed to this extent and does not always exist in all places of the globe. Therefore, we know homelessness is not inevitable. We do not have to accept this as a necessary evil. In the United States today, many Americans are living on the edge, forced to choose between basic necessities like purchasing food, paying rent, or going to the doctor. 43.1 million, that is the number of Americans living below the poverty line. 549,000 is the number of Americans who are homeless on a typical night. 42 million Americans are at risk of suffering from hunger. 
and one in five children in the United States lives in poverty. In Philadelphia alone, about 12,000 people access shelter each year, and people are turned away for various reasons from shelter, but most often because the shelters are at full capacity. How can we use our massive population to solve a massive problem like hunger and homelessness? It starts with a shift away from the outdated and inefficient systems and towards what I call a community-first paradigm. One area of community-first growth for Sriha is sheltering people together with their pets. 70% of people in the United States have pets, and there are more children in the U.S. today that are growing up with pets than with siblings or fathers. How many of you have a pet? Okay, so that's quite many of you. Um, so uh, while most of us consider our pets to be our family, it is hard to fathom having to be permanently separated from our pet, our family member. But this is the situation for most pet owners who become homeless and need to access shelter. Approximately 25% of people who become homeless are turned out on the streets with their pets. Once homeless, pet owners find it nearly impossible to access services together. There are no shelters in Philadelphia that house people with their pets and very few throughout the country. Philly's pet shelters, like most nationwide, are also in the midst of a crisis. 7.6 million pets are taken to U.S. shelters annually, and due to lack of capacity, shelters are annually forced to euthanize 2.7 million of these pets. That's around 36% of all pets who enter the shelters. Given this calculation, people prefer to live on the streets with their pets rather than be permanently separated from their best friend and often only companion, especially when they know this separation might lead to their pet being killed. In fact, um, for many people who are I have worked with, um, when they become homeless, they try to make it on the streets with their pets, and when that becomes too difficult, they give their, their pet up to act. Uh, the Philadelphia's pet shelter, and when they do that, they get a letter that says that their, their pet is likely to be euthanized, and that if they give their pet up, they'll, they'll never see their pet again. So one family, before they met me, they, they became homeless, they took their pet to the pet shelter, they got this letter, and they refused to give the pet up. So they sat in the parking lot hysterical with the pet, and somebody encountered them and knew me and connected the family to me, and then they came to me, um, and had no idea what to do. They were sleeping in the train station. This was uh, a few days before Thanksgiving, this past Thanksgiving. And um, we had them, we first put them up in a bed and, bed and breakfast, for, or um, rather an Airbnb for a few days. And we had their, their dog um, fostered. And then we were able to move the family into housing, which took about a month. And in that time, uh, we, when, once they were put in housing, we were able to reunite them with their pet. Uh, we've been doing that quite a bit lately, so um, many weeks I'll have somebody, a family or somebody coming to me who is suddenly homeless with their pets, and we, get, we try to get their pets fostered for a brief time and try to get them into housing. Uh, this generally takes about a month for us to get from the time the person is homeless to the time we get them into housing, and usually the only barrier between the person and housing is the first month last month in secure, um, and then we make sure that they stay in the housing. And we've been doing this for a while now, we have a 100% success rate of being able to get people in the housing and keep them in, in housing. Um, and in that month, while we're looking for the housing for the people, we're able to have their pets fostered. Um, this is not the solution. None of what we do is the solution. We're only just touching the surface. Um, but it's exposing a lot of the cracks and, and a lot of the problems in the system that we need to work on to fix the solution. Um, so, uh, so, especially when they know they're going to be separated, the separation might lead to the pet being killed. This has led to both humans and animals dying on the streets of Philadelphia, especially when temperatures drop below freezing. Every single winter, we lose neighbors, both two-legged and four-legged, to homelessness. In this city, where we have so much wealth, innovation, brilliance, and brotherly love, 
we are still losing people and animals every year to homelessness. Srihub has always taken a non-traditional and holistic approach to transitioning our residents into permanent housing. We provide people with the skills, resources, programs, and assistance they need to pull themselves up and out of the condition of homelessness. Through our strong partnerships with service providers and eight local, local universities, Street Hub is able to provide mental health care, physical health care, rehab and addiction recovery services, financial literacy courses, GED training, job training, and job assistance and housing workshops. While our model for moving people from the streets to housing was successful, we were failing those who were on the streets with their pets. Over the course of operating shelters and church basements for six years, Street Hub had to turn away countless individuals who were seeking shelter with their pets. This always broke my heart. But it was the story of a man on the streets and his love for his dog that was the motivation for me to change the way the whole system operates. It was a sweltering hot day in August in Philadelphia, and I was rushing to finish my errands and get to my air-conditioned house. As I was leaving the parking lot of Lowe's and Ikea, I spotted this man sitting with his dog and holding a sign that read, please help me and my best friend. It's an image that has become more familiar to us in large cities throughout the United States as the rate of homelessness grows. And in fact, it might be an image some of you could know exactly if you frequent the Lowe's or, or, um, or Ikea right on Delaware Avenue, um, that he sits in between the Wendy's and the yeah. Chick-fil-A, yeah, with his dog Pabu. So he's become kind of a site that people are familiar with. So some of you might have actually seen the exact site I'm referencing. Um, so uh, it's an image that has become more familiar to us in large cities throughout the United States as the rate of homelessness grows. In the United States today, many Americans are living on the edge. Uh, and so we see this constantly, especially this sight of people on the streets with, with their pets. Philadelphia is in a housing crisis. The problem is not only that income is low, but housing costs have skyrocketed. In addition to the competitive market, it has become increasingly difficult to find landlords that allow tenants who were previously homeless, many of whom have evictions on the record and poor credit history. City shelters are all at full capacity, and the wait list for low-income housing is only growing larger. Right now, if you get Section 8 housing, the gateway, this started in 2008, the, um, the federal government and states and cities adopted a change in how they manage homelessness. Prior to 2008, um, most of the money to, to like counteract homelessness went to homeless shelters. And in 2008, that shifted. It shifted because there was a report that came out of Penn by uh, Dennis Colhane. And he wrote a report, and his report basically said it is cheaper and more humane, not to mention, to house people than to give them permanent housing than to let them stay in a shelter, uh, which is true. However, because this report had a huge ripple effect. And the, the solution now that the government came up with based on these studies that Dennis Colhane and Penn were doing was that money that used to go to shelters were now going to uh, permanent, uh, uh, permanent housing. So you would get a housing voucher, a Section 8 housing voucher. So that the money that the federal government set aside, let's say just out of the sake of saying they had a million dollars, instead of putting that money into shelters, they put it into the housing vouchers. There were a bunch of problems with this solution. The first is that the entry way to get that housing voucher is the shelter. It made the shelter the gateway. So people who had been living in substandard housing or who had been doubling up, which is illegal, you know, met multiple families living in one unit, which is illegal, they moved out of those situations and into the shelter with the hope of getting a, per, a, a, a housing pass, a housing voucher. So at the same time that the shelters start to get their funding taken away, the shelters start filling up. This, this is when we came in. So this solution started in 2008. By 2011, it had destroyed uh, financially the Ridge Shelter in Philadelphia, which housed 300 people. So they closed the winter we opened, and they closed because of budget cuts. But no new shelters are coming on line. There's no new beds. So beds are taken away. So this becomes a problem that they're, they're moving the money from the shelter, which in theory makes sense. 
except that if you're going to make the shelter the gateway and not fund the shelter to take money away, the shelter's going to full capacity. In addition to that, uh, the program was supposed to be you get housing and wraparound services, but the wraparound services were incomplete. They either dried up after six months or they were never there to begin with. So people who became, who, who got into housing often lost their housing as a result. Uh, and then they ended up back in the shelter. In addition to that, the biggest problem with this is that the government hasn't taken more money into that pot. So let's say for the sake of saying they had a million dollars, which they don't, but let's just say. Um, and they were putting it into housing. That, that bucket hasn't gotten any bigger, but the housing prices have gone up dramatically. So if they only have this amount of money for the vouchers, they now have much fewer vouchers available because the, pri the price of housing goes up. So if they spend the voucher on subsidizing, like giving the money to the landlord, um, now they have just fewer vouchers because the landlord keeps raising the rent. Uh, from 2015 to 2017 in Philadelphia, housing prices went up 44%, but wages are stagnant. So uh, now to get a voucher, it's, it's a decades, plural, decades long wait list to get a voucher. The system that I have where people become homeless and they come to me, again, I tell you this is not a solution because um, the way people are connected to me is through Facebook, like generally or word of mouth. Someone will see somebody who's struggling and, and have, they will tag me on Facebook or they'll call me or they'll email me or text me and say, this is a person who's struggling. And, and I say, invite them over to my house. And they come to my house and I give them dinner uh, because I feel like that's the humane thing to do. They're in a stressful situation and I try to diffuse that over dinner. I assess their needs and then we uh, get to work immediately getting them into housing. But and this, the, then they have to wait for this decades long wait list. But it's not, it's a system that's clearly broken. Um, so this is, and this is what we still are dealing with right now. Uh, I noticed that um, this man who was on the street with his dog, as I saw, I'm going to go back to Heath and Papo. Um, it is in the context of this, the story that I just told you about how broken everything is. It is in this context that this image of Heath and Pabu, Heath and his dog Pabu on the corner of Delaware Avenue, becomes so familiar to us. What struck, struck me as I watched this encounter between the man and his dog is that on this day, as the afternoon sun beat, uh, beat down on the cement barrier on which they sat, the man was using his only umbrella to shield his dog from the heat while he absorbed all the oppressive sun rays. I also noticed that while there was no refreshing water or food for the man, his dog had a full bowl of water and food at his side. In all appearances, this man took better care of his pet, his best friend, than himself. I asked him if I could take his picture, and he cheerfully agreed. That night, I sat in bed thinking of this encounter. I shared the picture I took on Facebook and asked my friends if they would help me start Philadelphia's first shelter for people and pets. The reaction I received was overwhelmingly supportive. What surprised me is that when my photo went viral, many people were commenting that they knew this duo. It's Heath and Pabu, people exclaimed. I had dozens of people reach out to me to tell me stories of their encounters with Heath and Pabu. All the stories had a similar theme. Heath was always so caring and affectionate with his dog and took better care of his best friend than he did himself. I decided I had to go find Heath and learn more about him and his pet. I started to make it a ritual to go meet them around lunchtime and take, talk to Heath about his life and aspirations. Heath expressed to me that he would love to have shelter but cannot be separated from Prabhu. I promised him that I would work to create the supportable housing and community first shelter system in the region that would allow him shelter and services with his pet. They would stay together if I had anything to do with it. So with Heath and Prabhu as my inspiration, my organization and I set out to open the first shelter in the region for people and their pets. What I didn't realize is that when we committed to opening Philly's first shelter for people and pets, there would be a tremendous outpouring of support from the animal rescue community. In fact, I learned that the animal rescue community is in some regards better resourced than the human rescue community. <laughs> and donations to pet friendly organizations are on the rise. Charities that focus on animals have seen an increase in donations of 7.2% in the last couple of years. For years, my organization and I tried relentlessly to raise money for our vulnerable neighbors who are experiencing homelessness. 
I shouted from the rooftops. Our neighbors are dying on the streets. Money trickled in, but it was a challenge to meet our budget every year. When I said we would allow in pets, I did so in order to save the humans first. But it was only once I spoke to the need of pets did the money and support start to flow in. I jokingly told my board that had I known puppy use was the secret password, we would have had one as a mascot since day one. The life-saving potential of pets for our clients is well documented and researched. Pets help lower our blood pressure, increase levels of serotonin, and help us get exercise. Pet interactions help, uh, have been proven to reduce depression and even help mitigate the social, social withdrawal that is often associated with homelessness. They offer much needed companionship and increase the quality and quantity of social interactions with their human owners, increase the opportunity for new social bonds, decrease loneliness, and encourage healthy behavior. The social isolation that people experience on the streets can lead to depression and suicidal thinking, but pets for people who are homeless can be life-saving. Despite the known positive effects that, people, that pets have on those experiencing homelessness, there's mass discrimination against pet owners in poverty. When it comes to homelessness and housing policy, pets are kept out of both shelters and low-income housing. This discrimination might be due to the stigma some have of those living on the streets and on the margins. Our policies do not reflect the growing body of evidence that supports the need of pets and humans to be kept together. We should not be separating people from their pets. We don't have to choose between saving one or the other. We can do both. Sheltering people with their pets is easier, cost-effective, and more humane way to solve the problem of homelessness and animal euthanasia at the same time. Street Hawk leadership have been actively assessing locations that would allow for the largest population of vulnerable neighbors to be served along with their pets. We spent almost two years exploring various locations. Um, we were originally searching for non-residential buildings such as vacant hospitals, schools, warehouses, and other places not intended for habitation, which can take a year or more. These buildings would cost us upwards of $750,000 to a million dollars with renovations. We finally found a building that was relatively inexpensive compared to the other buildings we were exploring. We eventually had the building under contract. It seemed like the perfect fit for us. There was enough space for over 100 people to have their own bedrooms with their pets, a perfect spot for a gym, a room for a rooftop garden, and office space for our partners. There was room to grow and we were ecstatic thinking about the potential. But unfortunately, our biggest setback was NIMBYism, not in my backyard mentality. While we planned to be an epicenter for community gathering, we were met with obstacles from neighbors who did not want us to be part of their landscape. What we were cultivating a community for everyone that is inclusive, we were subject to people who wanted to exclude us from their community. We eventually had no choice but to leave the dream behind, and we were crushed. But nothing is ever truly lost. Street Hub is more than a building, it's a movement, and it has momentum and an energy that cannot be destroyed. We learned so much from this setback. We recognized where we needed to grow and learn and how we needed to adapt. We came out of the experience stronger and smarter and more effective as an organization. The setback was actually setting us up for the most thrilling new adventure. Instead of purchasing a building to make our home, Street Hub is now in the process of building villages of cozy cottages, small houses, for people experiencing homelessness with their pets. This plan is actually more compatible with what we know people need based on available data. People need homes. Our village of small homes will house the homeless and their pets um, with a community center on site that will provide shared meals and resources that help individuals become stabilized. We will have activities and workshops. We will have a large community garden and animal run space on the land. We are increasing the inventory of affordable housing in the city. We were inspired by other cities throughout this country and world who were toiling with similar problems and solutions. At Sriha, we were always learning from the very best in homeless prevention so that we can be our very best. We have traveled to San Francisco, LA, Eugene, Oregon, Edinburgh, Scotland, and elsewhere, always inspired by the wealth of innovation. 
I love traveling to new communities across the country and globe and to see how people in other places wrestle with the same problems we have. We learn from our collective spirit of innovation and problem solving, to borrow the best ideas from far away and to implement them back home, to remember that there are alternate ways of organizing ourselves, to imagine new realities, and to widen our nets and networks and to make room for the possible. When we started this newest project, I identified NIMBYism as our greatest challenge. To combat NIMBYism, Srihup went out early and often to forge relationships in our new community where we were building houses. We went every day to speak to our neighbors, ask what they envisioned for their community, and then helped create an action plan for how to work collectively to see their aspirations realized. They suggested community gardens. They were the ones who suggested the mural arts on their walls, more lighting on their streets, the removal of abandoned vehicles from their property. I'm so glad we took the opportunity to truly hear our neighbors' dreams and to work with them to see those dreams come to fruition. There was an open dialogue. It required us to truly listen, and also it required us to build trust. Going out to the grounds every day, in the rain, in the sweltering heat, when we wanted rest. We went out because we said we would, and building trust is hard, but necessary. The work we put in paid off in spades. It was both rewarding and vital. This work we are doing in solidarity with our neighbors is progressive, innovative, and forward-thinking, and it nurtures the environment along with our souls. It speaks to the interconnectivity of, uh, of us, to each other, and to nature. And the best part, it will bring us together as a community when we all don our hard hats and work together in building houses. We are creating a work of beauty and taking responsibility for these villages and for each other. And it is an, an adventure. The story of my transitional housing pro pro program is essentially about relationships. And relationships cannot be quantified. The relationships that develop in our space is indicative of the rich, layered, and often secret culture within the homeless community. These relationships have been life-saving for those who are the most vulnerable. The stories of the individuals and the relationships in our shelter matter. They change our minds. They drive us into the streets and into political office and into voting booths and into our legislators' offices and into each other's hearts and closer to ourselves. It is easy today to listen to the news and see the division and pain that is all around us and to feel helpless and hopeless. We have divisions all over the country, and we see it here in Philly, too. We are social beings, and we want to feel connected, valued, understood, useful, and truly seen. While we humans have the capacity to cause so much harm and destruction, we also have the ability to save each other and ourselves from doom and despair. I believe that each life is valuable and deserving of dignity and respect. When we know another story in suffering, we find empathy for each other and for ourselves. In saving one life, we have saved the world, and we have also saved ourselves because we are connected. I always say, Street Hub is all hands on deck. People of all backgrounds, races, religions, ages, socioeconomic status from all over Philadelphia have united in this mission of saving our neighbors. Together we have helped save lives, and we have watched in awe as our vulnerable neighbors have striven to save themselves. And we are all a little better, a little freer, a little more whole by participating and bearing witness to this struggle. Homelessness is a story of despair, but it's also a story of hope, community, love, compassion, and redemption. Thank you.